Howdy, y'all. I'm Dr. Jeff Jarvis, and I have another PIM for y'all. This one is about improving the safety of invasive airway management and streamlining our management of cardiac arrest care. This PIM, or Performance Improvement Module, is accompanying a directive that's going to be coming out shortly. This video is going to be explaining the rationale for that directive. So here are the challenges I'm trying to address with this directive. First off, our current car uh, cardiac arrest survival is below national average. Now, I talked about this in a video I did on why I want us delaying application of MCD. I am now changing our initial invasive airway in arrests from either a supraglottic or ETI to only a supraglottic. This means I want us to place the supraglottic as the first attempted invasive airway. In more clear terms, do not intubate a cardiac arrest unless, unless your initial attempt at supraglottic wasn't working and you feel intubation has a better chance of success than a second SGA attempt. Now, we know from our system data that our first pass success rate is between 60 and 70 percent. That, like our survival in cardiac arrest, is not acceptable and, for the good of our community, has to be improved. You're going to be seeing some additional changes roll out in the future, short-term future, about how we are improving the first pass success rate outside of cardiac arrest. But for right now, let's talk about cardiac arrest. So intubation in cardiac arrest is challenging for several reasons. First, patients are typically on the floor where it's hard to visualize the airway easily. Second, there is often a lot of airway gunk in there that makes intubation more difficult. No matter how much suction you have, it's just harder. And we have to intubate with ongoing compressions. It's hard for anybody. It also distracts our attention away from interventions that we know improve survival. Things like well-choreographed compressions and defibrillation. Supraglottics are inserted blindly so compressions don't interfere and they are easier to place and they have a much higher first pass success rate both nationally and in our system. There are several large well done randomized control trials that show intubation does not lead to improved survival. And finally, performing effective two-person BVM ventilation can also be challenging, often more challenging than placing a supraglottic. And because of that last part, I am authorizing rapid placement of a supraglottic at the beginning of the cardiac arrest, right after, right after establishing compressions and simultaneously with pad placement. If possible, if you can't do the supraglottic while you're placing the pads because you don't have enough people, well, then put the pads on and then shortly after drop the supraglottic. And that's right. That means you do not have to do passive oxygenation prior to supraglottic placement. This means most of cardiac arrest management is BLS. That is CPR, defib, supraglottic airway placement. I think that is appropriate. We honestly don't know the impact of the drugs we use. We don't know how to use them. And I don't mean our system. I mean from the scientific community, we're not sure what works and what doesn't. We do know that CPR, defib, and supraglottic works. So CPR, cardiac arrest, BLS issue, ALS is dressing on, I don't know, wherever that metaphor is going. So next up, Pediatric patients, and we define pediatric patients as those under 14. Now, nationally and in our own system data, intubation first pass success in kids is low, very low, in fact. In our system, it's 28%. That's right, 28% of the time, an intubation is successful in a kid on the first attempt. That means 72% of the time, we fail. Not a good thing. Now, we also know from national data that intubation first pass success rate increases with increasing patient age. Another way of saying that is it decreases the younger the patient is. But interestingly, this does not occur with supraglottics. Supraglottic first pass is consistent across all age groups, and at all age groups, it's higher than intubation. Now, 
we also know that first pass success matters. Failure to achieve first pass success is associated with more adverse events, primarily hypoxia and hypotension, and we know those increase the risk of death with any type of brain injury. Now, in cardiac arrest, each additional intubation attempt is associated with 59% lower odds of neurologically intact survival. Those are bad things. Bad, bad, bad. We don't like those. Now, one potential reason for our 28% first pass success rate in kids is that we almost never intubate kids. Specifically, on average, every medic in this system will attempt intubation on a child once every, wait for it, eight years. Years, my friends, years. So, no more intubation in pediatric patients regardless of the reason. Next, I am limiting the number of intubation attempts on all patients, cardiac arrest or not. So from now on, I'm limiting the number of attempts at intubation to two attempts per patient. And that is not per clinician. That's per patient. Now that number again is two. Two shall be the number and the number shall be two. The number shall not be three. Apologies to Monty Python. I just can't help myself sometimes. So that's it. Let me summarize these changes. These things will also be in the directive along with the citations for the papers that I talked about here. Number one, don't intubate pediatric patients regardless of the reason. Number two, superglottic is the initial invasive airway in cardiac arrest with intubation only if the superglottic fails. And number three, intubation attempts are limited to two per patient, not per clinician. That's it. Thanks for everything each one of you do to improve the quality of medical care in our system and the care you give our community every day. Thanks and take care, y'all.